Unfortunately, yesterday, storms in Washington uh, caused the cancellation of Angela's flight. So she and her PowerPoint will join us via video. Uh, she will start by giving us an overview of this whole situation. And then our panelists will offer their perspectives uh, from their sectors on how to meet the challenge. So I present to you Angela from Georgetown. Thank you, Susan. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to be with you. And, you know, again, I'm so, so sorry I couldn't be there because of the bad weather here in Washington, D.C., and that was passing through the country the past couple of days. But thank you to Min Post. Thank you to AARP Minnesota you know, for hosting this event today. And I'm just glad that technology allowed me to still be able to, to be part of this conversation. So uh, as Susan said, she asked me to sort of set the context about retire the retirement savings challenge and what's being done to address the challenges, and more specifically, what's being done by the states and why. So why are states acting today? Uh, Minnesota, as Susan said, there is a report that recently has been issued that talks about the retirement savings challenges and options uh, to be considered in Minnesota. Legislation that has been drafted, there will be hearings and discussions, no doubt, around all of that. Um, and Minnesota is like many other states, as I will show you very, very soon, uh, taking these kinds of actions to start to address the retirement savings crisis. And why are they doing that? They're doing it because it is a major financial concern for American families today. And it has been that way for more than a decade. Gallup polling has shown that the fear of outliving savings is significant. People are not saving enough for retirement. Um, and they have serious concerns that as they age, the, the money that they do have will not last through their lifetime. And the reality is social security is just simply not going to be enough to cover those uh, expenses in retirement. I mean, the numbers are sort of, are already very uh, stark and, and disturbing with respect to the, the amount of our population that is dependent uh, very heavily on social security. Today, almost half of unmarried retirees rely for social security for 90% of their income. And more than a quarter of married couples that are retired rely on social security for more than 90% of their income. Uh, and so this is something as 10,000 Americans are turning 65 every day, today between now and 2030, we have, to, uh, we have to pay attention to these concerns and the lack of retirement readiness. And one of the contributing factors to why our citizens are not really well prepared and retirement ready is because more than half of the private sector workforce lacks access to a way to save through an employer-sponsored plan. And we know that having access to an employer-sponsored plan is one of the best ways for workers to save for their retirement. And what are the consequences? Policymakers are acting in the states because they see the lack of retirement readiness and they understand that there are long-term budget and economic consequences to not taking action. What are the long-term budget consequences? They can be enormous. Because as I mentioned, we already see the heavy dependence on Social Security for 90% or more of retirees' income. Um, but they tend not to rely just on Social Security. They're also going to rely on other social safety net programs. They will rely on Medicare and Medicaid. They will rely on need for housing subsidies, energy assistance, food stamps. So the impact on social safety net programs and budgetary impact has the potential, it is already significant, as we see at the debates at the state as well as national level. And that only has the potential to get more challenging and more difficult to deal with as we go forward. And then there, there are economic consequences of that, certainly as entitlement spending uh, has to continue to increase and what are the tax implications of that. On the other side, if we're able to help more workers save for retirement and they have more income in retirement, guess what? They're able to spend and contribute to the economy and there are significant economic benefits to doing that. And so we have a lot of incentives on the side with policymakers today, understanding the nature of the problem. And you know, one of the biggest reasons why states are taking action is factoring in the lack of retirement readiness understanding the long-term budget and economic consequences, but also the reality that we have simply made no progress in 40 years 
to close the private sector access gap. You look at this chart and it has been fairly steady, give, it or, give or take a few percentage points that half of our private sector workers do not have access. 55 million American workers today do not have a way to save through an employer sponsored, uh, through an employer sponsored plan. And so we are at a point now where I believe the state initiatives that we see happening and the focus on retirement security, we are at a point where we could really make a significant impact to change a trend that we have been unable to, both Washington and the private sector has been unable to address for 40 years. And, and, and again, some very interesting things now that we see happening in the states that have the potential to change this. Again, as defined benefit plans have declined um, and probably less than 20% of the population has access to defined benefit plans and the rise of defined contribution savings uh, as the primary vehicle. But again, workers, even if they do have access to defined contribution plans, are not necessarily either saving or saving enough for a variety of reasons. Um, but again, that is work, that is compounded. The problem is compounded by virtue of the fact that, again, more than 55 million American workers, more than half the private sector workforce doesn't even have an easy way to save. So why should Minnesota act? Again, the report that was just issued helps understand this in, in more concrete, real terms. Again, 40% of the private sector workers in Minnesota are not covered by an employer plan. Small businesses lack plans. 95, and this is what we see in Minnesota, is, is indicative of the rest of the country. America is largely a small business nation. Um, more than 99% of all small businesses, 99% uh, of all businesses in the U.S. are small businesses. In Minnesota, 95% of the state businesses are under 100, and 60% of them don't provide an employer-sponsored plan. And if they're really small, 10 or fewer employees, then 78% of them don't. We have a rapidly aging population. As I said, I call it a silver tsunami, uh, where 10,000 Americans are turning 65 every day. Actually, Minnesota's population is going to be aging even more rapidly than we see nationally, with an 84% growth in those numbers, 65 and over, by 2030. So one in five of your population is going to be over age 65 in, in the next you know, 15 years. And again, a little safe for retirement. The report that was issued shows in, in uh, Minnesota about average $38,000 in a defined contribution account. If you turn that in, you annuitize that, it's maybe about $250 a month in additional income to supplement Social Security, which isn't very much. Nationally, the average monthly benefit is about $1,341. And again, the significant budget savings and economic benefits of taking action. Um, the study that was done by SIVA Consulting, state by state, shows that in the first 10 years of having these state-facilitated plans set up, the potential savings in Minnesota could be $124 million in Medicaid savings alone. Uh, and actually in Minnesota, that, that savings, I'm not fam real familiar with what's happening in Minnesota with your Medicaid program, but those that cost savings actually is in the top 10 of the states uh, for the potential savings in Medicaid for if you had a state-facilitated plan. Again, uh, if we can help retirees save, even helping them save a little bit and helping young people today start to save a little bit Again, if they're able to start in their 20s and save for 40 years, sometimes opponents will minimize uh, the value of saving $25 or $50. You cannot underestimate the value of saving $25 or $50. Any little bit of amount that workers can begin to set aside, and the earlier they can do that, the better it is. And at the end of the day, they will have more money in their retirement. And again, there are great economic benefits to do that. For every 100 retirees new to a community, or able to spend money and contribute to that community economically, you have 55 new jobs created. 55 new jobs that could be created. So, given the lack of retirement readiness, given that for four decades we have not been able to close the private, the lack of access gap among private sector workers, states jump in. States are problem solvers. Uh, they, they, they have to be. They're closer to the people. People expect. Uh, that issues are going to be addressed at the state and local level and really do the heavy lifting. Minnesota was one of the first states to highlight the challenges with respect to retirement readiness in 2014 in launching that study uh, that you now have. Uh, and it really helped propel other states. Uh, again, I'll show you just how much we've accomplished in just a few years. So states are stepping up. 
Their goal is to design simple, effective, low-cost, easy, accessible, and effective savings options for private sector workers. There's strong bipartisan support for this, contrary to what you might hear. 75% uh, of Americans uh, polled support state-facilitated plans. In polling that's been done for uh, the past few years by the National Institute of Retirement Security, uh, among uh, polled uh, self-identified Republicans, 73% uh, support state facilitated plans, and more than 80% of those who identified as Democrats support state facilitated plans. This has been a bipartisan uh, idea and initiative that's been advanced for several years now. And again, because of state leadership, we, we are really on the edge of being able to finally make some significant breakthroughs as long as Washington doesn't get in the way, and I'll talk about that a little bit. And there's strong small business, business support. And I want to emphasize what my experience has been working with, and I work with more than 25 states on a regular basis, that when you actually talk to small businesses in the states, as opposed to having it filtered through national organizations that supposedly represent small businesses, small businesses are very... Uh, encouraging and supportive of state facilitated plans. Um, they understand that it's good to help recruit and retain employees. Um, and quite honestly, in some cases, the existence of a state facilitated plan sort of as a nudge is just going to help overall encourage greater retirement plan adoption by more employers. So there are great benefits to these actions. This is the map. Since 2012, 40 states have considered or enacted private sector retirement initiatives. This is phenomenal progress in a very short time. The private sector has said and has readily admitted that for low and moderate income workers, for the very small businesses, it has not been profitable to serve these populations. Hence why for four decades now, we've not seen a lot of progress made to close this access gap. What states have essentially said is, look, we understand what we may be facing in terms of budget and economic consequences from an aging poor population. We're reaching out to you in the form of public-private partnerships, private sector, and we want to partner with you. And working with you, we will bring you into the fold and through setting up a state-facilitated program, work with you because these programs will be administered by outside third parties, namely the financial industry and others, um, to help bring together low and moderate income workers and get these small businesses in, and in fact, make it easier for the private sector to serve these populations. So I've always found it a little bit baffling why the private sector, uh, some corners have been challenging uh, these state initiatives. Again, there's lots of opportunities that through these public-private partnerships, the private sector will have to have it be more worth their while to be able to serve populations that, again, they have readily admitted they are not interested and it's not been profitable for them to serve. So when you look at this map, you see the red. The red are the eight states that have programs that are in place and being implemented. Um, in addition, we've seen uh, yellow and green signifying the green states actually show in 2017, even with new Congress, new administration, some issues that I'll mention very briefly uh, that have come up that have been introducing legislative proposals, uh, whether they be program bills or study bills. But again, overall, just since 2012, and really between 2014 and 2017, we've seen all but 10 states start to focus on the issue of retirement security. It's phenomenal progress, and hopefully Washington will not interfere with that. Eight states and three models adopted to date, as I mentioned. So when you look at this, these are all of the options that states have to choose from. And we continue, and the beauty of the state level action is the ability to experiment and to innovate. Um, so what you see here is very quickly the five states, California, Illinois, Oregon, Maryland, and Connecticut, that have the mandatory auto enroll IRA programs. And then we have uh, Washington and New Jersey with marketplaces. You see that on the right side, on the lower, number three. And then you have Massachusetts on the right side, and number two with a prototype plan which is for targeted for nonprofits. Again, most of these options are all voluntary. You have on the left side, the ERISA exempt, which are largely the payroll deduction IRA approach. Number two is the, the auto enroll. DOL, the US Department of Labor between 2015 and 2016, basically issued rules and guidance that sort of set this framework for these options of what's ERISA, 
exempt, which are the options you see on the left side related to IRAs, and on the ERISA-based plans on the right side of your screen, which are the multiple employer type plans. They allow for state open MEPs. Um, and I point out they allow for state facilitated open MEPs. One of the challenges uh, and controversies is that they didn't open the MEPs for the private sector. That's something that Washington is considering doing as well. They've been considering it legislatively for a few years and they will likely, uh, probably the likelihood of seeing that happen this year uh, is probably the best it's been. And then you have master prototype plans and the marketplace options. But let me point out to you the bottom, the combination of multi-tiered options. So given these six options on, that you see on the top, uh, top part of the slide, what we've seen states, uh, again, be innovative is thinking about how we, can how we can combine these different options that we have. Could we have a voluntary open map? If it's an ERISA plan, it must be voluntary for employers. So understanding that, let's try a voluntary state facilitated open map and see how that is. In the event that perhaps there isn't the uptake that you would expect, then we'll also make available an auto IRA program, uh, whether it be a plain payroll deduction IRA or it could be a mandatory auto IRA. So again, combining these different options is the direction that now uh, with lessons learned and progress that's been made, uh, states are considering, uh, considering uh, combining and thinking in new ways about how to address this problem and construct these program designs. Some of the lessons I just want to share with you really quickly in Minnesota, as you think about designing legislation and a program, it, in many of the states, they, they had to take the time to understand their states, their population, what the small businesses look like, the industries. Um, you know, we talk about the contingent and gig workforce, a lot of independent contractors, what will you do with that? Engaging and bringing a lot of stakeholders to the table early and often, uh, treasurers, uh, who are often tasked to implement these programs, spend a lot of time going around their states and having discussions uh, with stakeholders and small businesses. And in doing that, it helps refine the overall policy goals and objectives so that you make the right program design decision and what works best for your states. And ultimately, what we've now seen after a few, a few years of experiences, states drafting bills, they're not nearly as uh, specific with respect to locking in program design details because what they've learned is they will learn and they need to be flexible and to adjust. And so as setting up oversight boards, delegating to those boards the responsibilities to figure out a lot of the design details, does your default contribution rates, what the product is that's going to be offered and so on, and, and employers that can participate. And in states that are getting ready to launch, they're doing it through pilot tests and more phased in approaches. So taking a very methodical approach to, to to, to ensure success. And at the end of the day, obviously with state programs and you know, public programs generally, transparency and accountability are must. And so taking the time to make sure that the process is always an open process, because at the end of the day, the public will hold you accountable for your programs and the results of those programs and the dollars that are, that are spent. So what to watch in 2017? You have a new Congress and administration. So two months now has felt like two years sitting here in Washington. There's a lot that's still to be determined and discussed. We will have to see what a new administration uh, and Congress does with respect to the DOL rules that, in, again, when I showed you the options that are available. It's possible that the, that the Congress may uh, rescind the safe harbor that'll, that allows for mandatory auto enroll IRAs to be exempt from ERISA. However, if that does happen, that does not stop state programs. It may create some uncertainty and just simply takes it back to where we were in 2015, where states were asking DOL, hi, we've passed these laws. We want to move forward with these programs. We'd really appreciate if you tell us whether or not they're subject to ERISA. That's exactly what DOL did. To the extent they rescind the rules, there's just some uncertainty around that. And ultimately, the programs can move forward. And more than likely, the, the, uh, the ERISA applicability to those plans will be determined uh, probably through litigation. Uh, tax reform, the, the retirement savings system is all underpinned through uh, tax law and the tax code. And so what will happen there will have a significant impact on retirement savings, and we need to watch that with respect to IRAs, 401ks, employer-sponsored plans. Big is that Washington and Oregon are going to be the first states to launch uh, in 2017, again with pilot programs in the, in the second half of this year, and then hopefully full launch 
in 2018. One of the great things with the state nudge and seeing all of this, this state activity is that quite honestly, I think the private sector has realized they had to up their game in response to what they see happening. And quite honestly, the fact that the status quo is just not working. Something has to change. Somebody has to do something. States are doing that. But the private sector is getting the push. And so the role of technology, especially with millennials having savings on you know apps on phones, really easy, simple uh, use of technology that makes it easy to make those decisions to start to save. Investment education efforts, I don't know if you all see it, but I certainly see it, whether it's Prudential, Fidelity, Vanguard, pick your company. I think they are now starting, uh, as people look at their retirement savings through their employers, you see much more of a discussion and question about what are your end goals? Do you feel like you're prepared for retirement? Rather than what it's been just savings for savings sake and no real talk about lifetime income, more discussion around that, education around that, and what you need to do as an individual to adequately prepare. And auto portability issues as another example. We have a problem where workers sometimes that more today have many different jobs. And so they're moving around a lot. Sometimes accounts get lost. So how can we use technology to help uh, accounts stay attached to individuals as they move for employers. So there's innovation that's going on. Um, I'm not sure if Washington and the states stop focusing on putting pressure with respect to retirement readiness, that this innovation will continue, uh, continue to occur. Um, uh, we'd like to think it would, but uh, again, I think there's great benefits to these public-private partnerships, uh, and I think we're beginning to see that. And then we need to tackle some really challenging public policy issues overall that we haven't done in addition to closing the gap. The big issue is lifetime income. Again, it's not just savings for savings sake, but people want to have, they want to be able to save and we want to help them be able to save so it's income that lasts them for a lifetime. And so how do we help them understand that? Because a lot of workers today, when they get ready to retire, go to their employers, they take out the money as a lump sum, and they're not always the best at managing that to last a lifetime. So the and annuitization, looking at annuities, Connecticut is the one state program that has as part of its program, taking part of the savings and actually dedicating that, that fund, those funds to, a, um, to, a, to an annuity uh, as part of their program. So again, lots of exciting things that have happened. A little bit of uncertainty with the new administration in Congress uh, and how they will play with respect to retirement savings and security. But again, I remain very optimistic. The states will continue to move forward. Uh, we'll just have to get some of these policy questions if they become a little bit unclear again and get that clarity uh, and allow us to continue to move forward. And I'll leave you with, this is federalism, the way federalism is supposed to work. Uh, Senator Bob Corker on the floor of the Senate recently talking about the the, uh, the DOL regs, um, which again, Congress is contemplating rescinding. For Senator Corker is a Republican who believes that the state should have the freedom to basically look at all of these options, not have any of them restricted, and look at what works best. And I believe that over time, it's a little bit messy and we have lots of different things going on right now with the states, but over time, with state experimentation and innovation, we will learn and we will get better at understanding what works and again, I think we have the opportunity to change what has been uh, unchanged for more than four decades uh, with respect to retirement savings and security. So with that, I will stop. That is our website, cri.georgetown.edu. We recently did a report for the state of Vermont as for their study group. Um, you can find all information on what's happening in the states legislatively uh, and program implementation activities by going to our website as well as uh, links to all uh, various groups uh, that uh, work on retirement security issues. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity. I look forward to the discussion and answering your questions.